The idea cut on like wildfire. There wasn't a man who thought we couldn't do it. We made the decision official at a meeting on May the 30th, held a tag day on June the 1st, and left on June the 3rd, 1935. And there weren't any brass bands. They marched in divisions, very calm and very disciplined. And aside from a few stool pigeons, they were the cream of the crop. And hundreds of well-wishers were there with parcels of food and words of encouragement. Then in the old CPR freight yards at the foot of Gore, the words rang out, Division 1, board the train. Division 2, board the train. Division 3, board the train. And the train slowly began to pick up speed, and our boys were off to Ottawa. Our first stop in Kamloops the next morning was hard. There hadn't been much time for our advance party to plan for our arrival. But by the time we bedded down under the stars that night, our bellies were full and our spirits were high. In Golden, the next stop, there were bubbling pots of stew as big as bathtubs, waiting for us with a hospitality that we shall never forget. By the time we got to Calgary, our number had grown to 1,600 and more were on the way. Medicine Hat. Swift Current, Moose Jaw. Each stop brought more public support. Every time we boarded the train headed east, our strength and confidence had grown. Our entry into Regina, my hometown, June the 14th, was something of a triumph. As we marched through the city streets, throngs of people lined the sidewalk to show their support. There was an official welcome prepared for us with speeches, congratulations, and a choir saying. The Saskatchewan Premier Gardener, a liberal, had even agreed to provide us with three days of leave before we had a chance to demonstrate. The Regina Citizens Emergency Committee, a support group of 20 organizations had been formed on our behalf. 500 men from the Dundurn Relief Camp joined our ranks. We knew that upwards of 5,000 single unemployed were waiting to join us in Winnipeg. Ottawa finally got the message they could no longer ignore what was becoming an epidemic of discontent. Two cabinet ministers, Mannion and Weir, arrived in Regina on June the 17th, and they wanted to deal. They proposed that a delegation of eight proceed to Ottawa to negotiate with the government while the rest of the trekkers stayed in Regina, all at government expense. In modern day language, it was an offer we couldn't refuse after all. The whole reason for the trek had been to negotiate with the government. We recommend that the main body of strikers stay in Regina, while the same delegates that had met with Mr. Mannion and Mr. Weir go off to Ottawa. I present the proposition. Regardless of whether or not we believe this to be a trap, we must accept the proposals. We've been fighting for this for two and a half months. If we refuse, we'll be discredited. If we go, they'll arrest us. We have no choice. We've demanded a hearing in Ottawa. If we don't go, we'll lose the public support. It's a trap! We have no choice! The vote to stay in Regina and send us to Ottawa carries without one dissenting vote. Have you heard? The leaders of the relief camp workers are on their way to Ottawa. So off we go. There are eight of us. Myself, Tony Martin, Pete Nielsen, Red Walsh, Jack Cosgrove, Patty O'Neill, Mike McCauley, and Doc Savage. First class, upholstered seats and dining car service, straight to hell, to meet the Prime Minister of Canada, R.B. Bennett, June the 22nd, 1935. If you can call it a meeting, while Bennett sits, we're not even offered a chair. For half an hour, we stand. He abuses us and forces us to listen to a blustering anti-communist tirade. We're interrogated like schoolboys. It's as if our list of negotiable demands don't even exist and are simply out of the question. We want to talk about work, wages, medical attention, the right to vote, unemployment insurance. All Bennett wants to do is listen to the sound of his own voice. He accuses me of being an embezzler. I call him a liar. He accuses the men of not showing much interest in finding work. I explode and say anyone who uses such despicable tactics is not fit to be the Prime Minister of Canada. That ends the discussion. 
I'm as mild-mannered man as can be And I've never done no harm that I can see Still on me they put the ban And they throw me in the can They go wild, simply wild over me They accuse me of rascality But I can't see why they always pick on me I'm as gentle as a lamb But they take me for a ram They go wild, simply wild over me Oh, the jailer went wild over me And he locked me up and threw away the key Well, it seems to be a rage Cause they threw me in a cage They go wild, simply wild over me Will the roses grow wild over me When I'm gone into that land that is to be When my soul and body part In the stillness of my heart Will the roses grow wild over me by the time the delegation had returned to Regina, the two railroads, pressured by the government, tightened security and made it impossible to ride the freights. The attempt to move by truck, car, bus, or even on foot would fall under vacancy sections of the criminal code. The Regina newspaper stated, prosecution faces any person who assists the relief strikers any way. Relief was cut off. Colonel Wood of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police had 500 constables at his command and was taking his orders directly for Ottawa, much to Premier Gardner's outrage. The trap was set, we couldn't go, and we couldn't stay. The trap sprung. It was Dominion Day, July the 1st, 1935. An evening meeting was called to hear a report from our return delegates. About 3,000 townspeople attended most of the trekkers, having already heard the report, were off at a local baseball game. Large moving vans, innocently parked around the square, burst open at the shrill of a whistle. Out poured the Mounties, each armed with clubs as big as baseball bats. At the same time, the city police came charging out of their station. They waded into the crowd like wild men, clubbing defenseless citizens to the ground as they went. The leaders of the trek were arrested the police riot was on, and the on to Ottawa trek was off. The battle lasted until 2 o'clock in the morning. Hundreds were seriously wounded. Some were crippled for life. If the police had wanted to, they could have arrested the trek leaders that afternoon at 5 p.m. in Premier Gardner's office. The whole idea had been to destroy our organization. We were pinched under that infamous Section 98 of the Criminal Code, where the government can declare any organization illegal. So they nailed the Relief Camp Workers Union and took away all our rights. Then they scared the bejesus out of anyone who might help us. If you're even caught with a leaflet about the strike, you're a red and you could be tried for treason. Plenty of guys rotted in jail under Section 98. The following day, Premier Gardner regained his rightful constitutional control over the RCMP. The machine guns trained on the gates of the stadium where we were billeted were removed. Relief and train fare back home was provided. And the charges against the leaders were dropped because lack of evidence. The arrogant and brutal policies of the Bennett government lay completely exposed. He was defeated in the next election and disappeared from public life. The relief camps were later abolished. Many years have passed since we marched through the streets of Vancouver singing Hold the Fort. Times change, and we change with them. When war came in 1939, there were jobs for everyone, and we all became heroes. Overnight, there was money for everything, money for bombs, guns, planes, and battleships. For 10 long, weary years, investment capital had been frozen in the hands of the very wealthy, waiting for a chance to make a huge profit. And war brought that chance. Fortunes were made as lives were lost. Some of them are trekkers. 
For the next 40 years, we all rode the economy the way we used to ride the freights in the dirty 30s. Up and down, over the straight, hot flowing prairies when times were good, holding on for dear life through the cold mountain passes when times were hard. Never knowing what the next bend would bring or when the next boom or bust would end. Unemployment insurance and health insurance were finally won. Welfare for the needy. Even unions grew with the good times. Gradually, like a train picking up speed, things begin to change. Suddenly, I'm an angry young man again. Here, here. Massive unemployment is everywhere, and the unthinkable war is here. Food banks, evictions, bankruptcies, farm foreclosures are growing everywhere, and everywhere our youth is hit the hardest. For millions of unemployed Canadians, our slogan of work and wages is still as valid today as it was then. I want to say to the young people of Canada, there's no shame in being unemployed. It is not your fault. But if you don't fight back and organize, that would be a bloody shame. We meet today in Stop. 